All right, so the best thing you can have is a steel, a meat hook, a dull knife, and a sharp boning knife. Totally key, and you'll see why in a minute. So now what we're going to do is we're going to quarter the animal, and there's a couple of ways to do this. You know, one of the things that I learned early on was like, you know, I, I, when I had my first cut sheet from uh, a butchering facility, they were like, well, do you want this, this, or this? And I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, well, they're like, well, if you want some of this, there's going to be less of that, and there's going to be more of this and more of that. So it, it depends on how you cut the animal. The way that I like to do it is that you have the neck, right? You have the back straps, you have the front shoulders, and you have the hind quarters. All right, so that's really the rundown on the deer. If you start with the top of the neck and you take the neck meat is the, the hardest part to keep clean. So what I like to do is take the neck meat with the front shoulder. So that way I know that this is gonna be my biggest hassle to butcher. So if I take it all together, I know that when I put it on the table, that's what I have to deal with. And, you know, and then it's out of the way. Then the rest of it is easy. It's the back straps, which are easy. And it's the hindquarters, which are a lot of fun. So, you know, usually what I do, bear with me, Joe, if you have some in there. So, the spine runs down, obviously, the middle. There are tendons that run along the neck. If you can cut to the side of the tendons, down on both sides, so you're just going down the spinal column, on both sides, then you go around, right, and hold that. Now, the chest cavity, this is all ribs down here. You can see that there's contusions from the impact. What I generally try to do to take the shoulder off, and the shoulder is not connected by any bones, it's only connective tissue. What I like to do is take all the meat, and then later on I can decide what we're going to do with it. So what I do is I go down along the brisket, right? Work my way along just like you're filleting a fish. And this way you get the maximum amount of meat. And I have the knife at a 45 degree angle so that I'm scribing along the rib cage. And you can see that you can see the rib bones along there. So now what I'm doing is I'm literally walking along very deliberate cuts until I get to the end, which is where there are the tenderloins, or the uh, back straps, excuse me. So the back strap starts at the very top of the rib cage. You don't want to cut into the back strap, so ride along it, and you can see where the fascia line is along there. And what I do is walk along, and that's it. So that's the front shoulder. Now these are always contaminated because the front shoulder is where people take their shots. So I try to keep that separate. Keep that off to the side. Same thing with the other side. Down about midsection of the deer. As you can see, there's no bone to bone connection there. Right. There's no ball and socket joint. Just super no easy, super straightforward. And that's it. And you can see there's nothing but bone. So you've got all the meat off of there. And he's got the front shoulder. We can clean that up after. That's good. So back straps. Same thing. Bone runs right along the ridge line. Take your knife run pushing against the inside of the spine and it'll walk you along it and if you keep the knife at 45 degrees it will walk right down to the hip joint which is right there and it actually if you push in there you can feel there's a, a flared bone that comes out there so now you've got that separated now you take the top and cut it. And if you hold the knife in this fashion, 
what happens is, is that you can rotate, turn, cut. It's a much more efficient way to cut. So that when you walk along the edge, you can scribe along the bone and you've already made the incision that goes all the way down to the tailbone before you get to the leg rows. And now with this, you can sit here and rotate around all the joints that are there. So all I'm doing is going in, rotating, and then ripping out. And what that does is it lets the knife walk along the rib cage so that you're doing the same thing that you did to take the front shoulders off, but you're doing it the opposite direction. And you can see that I'm not leaving any meat behind. And, and that's is, really the goal. This is considered arguably the best cut on the deer. So again, if you're doing this for the first time, take you know, take, definitely take, take, your, take time. your time and hug the bones. You really can't go wrong as long as you're hugging the bones. And if you look, what Joe's talking about is I'm literally going in and hitting the bone, rotating the knife 45 degrees, and then scribing down the joint, running along the rib cage, the top of the rib cage. So what happens is you end up getting the entire thing. Now down at the bottom, you have that, that flange point I was talking about. Thanks. So what we do is you feel for it, you cut in, go down on the hip joint. So you're above the hip joint. So now when you go in, you take that out. and you've got your entire back strap, and what you have is no meat left behind, nothing but bones, and if you, if you do leave something, it doesn't really matter, you can go back and get it. So I mean, if, if you want to, you can go back and trim some of this off, if you feel like you missed something, if you didn't feel like you did a good job, it's not that big a deal. You can go back and trim, like, like okay, there's a little bit there, like, you know, and remember, I measure everything in bites. That's a bite. <laughs> you can see how the, the uh, vertebrae almost go almost at a 90 degree angle there so so I think a common mistake is is when they're trying to come back up this way they might not end up hugging the rib cage and and they might leave a lot of meat there and it's kind of a waste because that's all steak again like Brian said it'll turn into burger meat just fine but you want to keep as much of the steak as you can and intact not, intact it's like flaying a fish now, right. and if, if a lot of people make the mistake of starting from this side and working their way in, I think that, and just opinion, that if you start from the top of the spine and work your way out, yep. then you're guaranteed to get as much of the meat as you possibly can, as opposed to trying to hack your way in this way and work from the inside in. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So this way, you're getting a nice clean cut. Hind quarter, my favorite part to, to do, a lot of fun. Um, there's that flanged part of that hip joint that we had right here. We're just gonna work on the other side of it and then we're just gonna fillet this down exactly the same way that we did with the back strap. So we cut in, go down the spine, same thing as the continuation of up at the top, around the tail. And all I'm doing is scribing the knife along the bone, once again, like this. And this is so hard to explain, but what I'm doing is I'm literally filleting back underneath the hip joint down. And what you have is you have a little flange point down at the end that shows up. You dig around the tip, which is below the socket. So here's the, the anal cavity right here. Right next to it is a little tiny flanged piece that comes out. You go around it. It's like a wing. Like a wing. You go around it, and then you go right back in. And then if you do it right, what should happen 
is it should walk you into the ball joint. And once you're in the ball joint, okay, so that's the ball joint right there, okay? There's a little piece of connective tissue that runs from the top of the ball joint to the inside of the joint cavity. If you just take your knife and go sideways and cut, it'll drop right off. And now what you've got is a meat situation. You've got total disconnectivity between the joint and the rest of the deer. Another tail piece right down at the end of the outside of the tail cavity. Out. And again, see how he's holding the knife? You have a lot of control. We almost feel like an axe murderer that way, but you have the best control when you hold the knife like that. And that's it. And you see, there's no meat left on the inside of this. Yep. Ball joint clean. Beautiful. And that's it. And then the rest of this meat will come off with this leg. And we're done. And this is where you want to take your time because this is where all your steaks come from is in the hind quarters. You know, I think we mentioned earlier that the front shoulders, you'll get a couple little steaks, but really that means best for stew meat or burger for your grind. But this is where you get some real steaks other than the uh, back straps. I just keep a paper towel handy if you ever see any more hair that you might have missed. Just takes a couple minutes to wipe it down. You can also do it on the butchering table, but I like to try and get as much of the hair off before it hits the table. Ah, so much better. All I did was fillet from the hip down along, just like a fish, no different. Scribe it down, hold the knife like a serial killer right into the joint across and now I'm just guiding on the on the outside of the anal cavity which if you did a good job when you butchered it or when you field dressed it then you end up with nice clean inside well you don't want anything from the inside you want everything from the outside so you walk along the edge nice deliberate cuts around that little tail piece I was talking about before which is a little Little wing, like Joe said. Inside. Are you ready? Yep. And you can always go back and get the pieces. Like if, if you're like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't get all that. You can always go back and get that. It's not a big deal. So, worst case scenario is, like I'll go back and I'll say, okay, you know, there's, there's a little something there. There's a bite. You know, I'll take that. Put that in the cooler. And I'd say that there is not much left there. You know, while we got this here too, Brian was mentioning the anal cavity. So I think gutting will be in a separate little episode, but um, you can see it's all bone in there. So when you're gutting the animal and you're going to cut out the anus of the animal, you know, now's a good time to see that it's just all bone. So don't be shy about getting your knife in there and skirting around that bone because you want to keep it wide and you don't want to you don't want to puncture anything that can contaminate your meat so and again that's why brian made the point that you know maybe you shouldn't be hunting if you don't know how to butcher your own deer because you learn anatomy you know your shot placement you know where you can shoot to make a good shot gutting you can learn you know how to gut just by the anatomy of the deer so when you're doing it you're going to want to hug your knife around that anal cavity you're not going to damage anything because it's just bone. So, so if you go in there through. without trying to skirt the bone, that's where you can puncture the intestines, puncture and sometimes platters in there. You can pop that and it'll ruin your meat. So, and again, the hind cores are where all the steaks are. So, you definitely want to be careful and not do anything to contaminate the best, you know, some of the best parts of the deer. So, the neck. Try to go as high as you possibly can to get as much of the meat off the animal, cut down both sides. You can also just lopper this off and keep it as a whole roast and, and, and cook it and then pull the bones out afterwards. But the spinal column of the deer has two wings that fit out on each side. It's kind of hard to explain, but if you, and it's gonna be hard to see, 
But you can fillet along the edge and you can take that neck meat and what people do is they take the neck after you bone it out, they'll still take the neck and cook it. And what you end up with is a little bit of meat there, a little bit of meat from the other side and there's one wing that runs along here, there's another wing that runs along here. When you're doing it, if you scribe along it, you can rotate in and kind of do a double scoop and you can get more of it. You want to watch out for the windpipe, the trachea. Take that out. That's junk. Take away that. All right. So now we take the carcass. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do with the deer. Um, the internal cavity of the deer is that was been exposed to. Uh, usually gut contamination or air or bacteria. But the one thing you can do is, is take the inside of the rib cage, run along it, and you can make dog treats out of it. You throw it in your oven, let these dry out. And all you're doing is just run along the rib cage, run it out and down. Out, down, and over. Now, if you didn't age the deer, some of that might be salvageable. I don't know how good the meat really is. So some people turn it into a grind, but everybody knows someone with a dog. Everybody knows someone with a dog. And we have different levels of when we butcher, which is we have we have dog food, we have stew meat, we have burger, and we have steaks. So even the stuff that normally people would waste, we try to at least turn into something that animals can eat so that we utilize the whole animal. So you're not wasting anything. I think the biggest dishonor you can do to any animal is to be flagrant about the waste, and I think that's a, that's a crime. Now what we've got are some yummy dog treats that somebody would probably pay top dollar for in a store. You know, up at the tribe, we do a lot of the same things. We reach out to folks who are there and we find out who's interested in taking hides to tan them. Uh, we'll find out if anybody's interested in taking the hoofs, if they want to use them to make bases for knives or other tools. Um, and then, you know, if we have stuff that's left over, we'll either uh, take it out to the edge of the woods and, and let the animals pick over it or we'll dig a hole with our tractor and we'll bury the bones and uh, we'll let the sort of the fungi and the insects have their way with it. So uh, we do a lot of the same. We try and make sure that whatever's left is getting used in some way or providing sustenance to some other part of the food chain. So this is the end result of a deer that we butchered here. And as you can see, there is almost nothing left. And ev absolutely every other part of this animal will be used. The bones will be used. The neck we're going to cut off, and we'll use that as a as a, a, a roast, or we'll use it for demi glaze. But other than that, I think that we've utilized 100% of this animal.